What's up, everyone? We're back. Welcome to Dr. The Unhinged. I'm Dr. Shaw. I'm Dr. Maxfield. All right. So we got some hot topics for you. We always start off with a uh, life update um, just so that I can catch up with Dr. Maxfield. <laughs> and then we're going to jump into the viral skincare trifecta. Is it the cure-all for all your skincare concerns? Going viral on TikTok usually means not a solve-all. Next up, we're going to be talking about the most popular skincare brand in 2023. What was the fastest growing skincare brand in the United States? Then we're going to be talking about Superdrug, which is this is for our UK audience, but it's going to be relevant for all of us. And then the value of YouTube. All right. Uh, we always lead off with our life update. Dr. Maxfield, what is going on? All right. Other than adjusting the audio, I feel like nothing is going on. I don't know. I came back from Miami. We shot YouTube. That was super fun. Just back here getting in the swing of things. Uh, you know, a lot of major changes happening on my end. We'll talk more of that about that probably in the next month to four months. I mean, we said it. This is a busy and a crazy year. Um, but we'll include everyone, all of you, as these changes all become official. But big year, um, nothing I can talk about, I guess. I'm just looking forward to summer. Weather's warming up. Like I'm looking forward to getting in the water tomorrow. Um, I'm super excited. This is my favorite time of year. Yeah, it's starting to get nice out. It's super nice out here where I'm at right now. Um, and Dr. Maxwell has a lot of really cool things on the agenda. So I'm excited to see those roll out. Uh, for me, uh, nothing big, you know, I'm going to get CR lab in, uh, Colorado actually next week and, uh, just check in on a, a new batch for a new product release that we're coming out with. So that's super exciting. Um, but, uh, but otherwise nothing big, you know, everything's steady with the brand. Um, you know, we're probably going to sell out of the lip product. I was just telling Dr. Maxfield. So, uh, if you, if you bought the lip product and you love it, um, now, now would be the time to repurchase cause we'll, we'll be out of stock for a little while. Um, but other than that, everything's going smooth. I mean, I'm listening to feedback as it comes in. I'm looking at reviews as they come in and trying to constantly improve. So, um, right, right now I feel like you, I kind of feel like steady and, and things are good. Um, that's, that's what I want. Like I, I, at this point I used to love the chaos at this point. I just want nothing to be happening. So <laughs> let's jump into our product of the day. What have you been loving lately, Dr. Maxfield? All right. So you got one of these two at the AAD. This is Clinique's cleansing balm mm. it's so we talked about cleansing balms we use them all the time great cleansing balm it is great it is absolutely great I, I think i mentioned this when we talked about double cleansing i think in that youtube video i told you that's that's a top tier product you sure did and i 100 percent agree um i shot a sunscreen video before we hopped on here after washing off probably 15 consecutive sunscreens i have appreciated this balm more and more and more and more it's very gentle. The volume is good. I think it weighs about 72 pounds. That may or may not be quite accurate, um, but it's a tremendous amount of volume. It's not super expensive. It's very gentle, very simple. And that's what I want out of a balm. Mm. Tell me, I'm not meaning to call you out here as I'm sensitive to <laughs> appearances. Um, what's going on with your cheek right now? Yeah, yeah. This is a new thing. This is a new thing. So I have perhaps depending if you're a healthcare company or an insurance company or not i may or may not have rosacea <laughs> do you remember when um four years ago i was sitting on the couch with you and i looked at you and i said you have rosacea <laughs> i remember and you were like no i don't and i was like yes you do <laughs> I, know. I saw it early stages like i looked at your pores and i said this guy's got rosacea and now it's manifesting four years later yeah four years later it's crazy though every time i travel now it's four trips in a row my skin breaks out and it may be the vitamins oh wait spoiler i don't know it may be the video or the water <laughs> or, the, or water. the water remember i told you well yeah well that was the second part um it may be the, the video we shot this last time that aggravated it but it also yeah, i swear it's the water like california where else was i california new york miami tennessee all four trips same like just the it all flares up so i'm going to have to lock down my skincare routine for this um but first I have to figure out what's going to help it because not much is helping. Could have been the vitamin C that we shot a, a YouTube video on vitamin C. Dr. Maxfield was alluding to should come out within the next two years. Um, <laughs> and um, it, uh, it, uh, it, I, we talk about how vitamin C can be irritating for some people. So 
uh, maybe this is a manifestation of that. Now I am some people, which is kind of trash. I've always been able to tolerate vitamin C. I actually always liked it, but uh, I may no longer, that may no longer be for me. Fair enough. Um, okay. Uh, Clinique on the rise, I would argue, mm-hmm. actually, now that you mentioned it. I, I was going to, you know, I had a thought to talk about it today, but now that you brought it up, I'm going to talk about it. Clinique is starting to double down on dermatologists again. Um, mm-hmm. So they were really invested in dermatologists from their founding. And uh, actually, all their products are fragrance free. I don't know if you knew that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they sort of like just ignored everybody for a long time and um, didn't really focus on sort of their roots. And now I, I believe Clinique is an Estee Lauder company. I could be wrong. Um, but now they're really kind of hired a whole new team of marketers and they're really starting to bring back their Durham core roots again. And I actually suspect um, over the next year that you're going to hear a lot more from Clinique as they double down um, on their marketing strategy. So I think Clinique is actually going to be on the forefront. They've even increased their distribution. I've seen them. I think they even expanded into Amazon finally, which seems long overdue for a brand like Clinique. Um, and so I expect that you're going to see a lot more for Clinique over the next next year. Clinique is hands down one of the most frequently used products in my patient population uh, mm-hmm. by far. It's what are you using Clinique? And that's more of a demographic thing. If Clinique can capture the 20, 30 year old population, I think they're going to have a hard time getting into the younger population. But if they can, if they can make that transition, they will be, they will explode this year. So one of the things I think brands don't realize is um, that certain things like programs that you cut, um, their impact is not felt until much later. So if you're a brand like Clinique and someone's using the yellow moisturizer, which I don't know what it's called, daily moisturizer, something like that, um, and or you you know take the day off their purple cleansing balm. Um, and you use it and you and you like it and it's part of your routine and suddenly you stop advertising to Gen Z and millennials and you stop, you know, talking about your dermatologist roots and you stop um just in general, like all the things that you were doing that got you on everyone's radar, you're not going to notice a dip in sales like immediately, right? Because the people who love the products like I just described, they're going to buy them over and over and over and over again, right? But you're just not acquiring new customers. And um, it usually shows much later where then all of a sudden you start to lose some of your old customers. And now, you know, you have to try to figure out how do you acquire new ones. And so I see that a lot with a lot of like kind of heritage brands where, you know, they were so big and then they cut a lot of their programs that made them great. And then and then they lose the audience and then they try to bring them back. And so it looks like Clinique is back in their growth era. So I'm super excited to watch that happen. My product of the day is the Peach and Lily Glass Skin Water Gel Moisturizer. Um, is that? Okay, okay. It's pink and white. I just wanted to see if it was the one I was thinking of. Sorry, continue. So Peach and Lily Glass Skin Moisturizer. Um, I just was on live the other day on TikTok and then it was next to me. So I used it and I was like, whoa, this is actually pretty sweet. Um, it's like $40, which I feel like is high for like a hyaluronic acid type based moisturizer. But like, look at this. It's got like um, kind of like a thicker consistency moisturizer, you know, kind of glycerin base. Um, but it's super nice and, and soothing. Like I really, really like it. Um, but it's like 40 bucks. So it's a little high, I think, for what it's doing. Uh, but it's it's definitely a nice moisturizer, especially for somebody who's got oily skin going into the summer. Oh, yeah. That is uh, summer moisturizers. It's a topic I love. That's a good one. All right. What uh, he's applying it for those of you who can't <laughs> for see. those of you who don't know. Let's hop into the, the, the real first topic, which is the skincare trifecta. So the skincare trifecta is something that's going viral on TikTok. I'll just tell you what it is. So this is not the first time something like this has happened, but basically you have one person and they go, listen up everyone. This is what I use for my skin. We saw this probably maybe a year ago with just, just use dove bar soap on your face and it cured all my problems. And then a bunch of other people do it and then it becomes a trend and it becomes viral. So right now what's going viral is this thing called the skincare trifecta. And this is a combination of three products, which I like a three step skincare routine. It is using Dial hand soap, dial hand soap, antibacterial hand soap, 
two, step two is the Neutrogena Pro Plus Retinol, actually. And number three step is the Gold Bond Moisturizer. So uh, what are your thoughts about that initial reactions? And these are all being layered onto the face sequentially? So yeah, you use the cleanser Mm -hmm. on the face, and then you use retinol, and then you use the Gold Bond Moisturizer. And it's not the Gold Bond Retinol Moisturizer? Uh, No, it's the Gold Bond... um, It's like a body moisturizer, I think. Okay. Just seeing if they're doubling up on the the retinol there. Because Gold Bond does have a legit... or Yeah, legit retinol body moisturizer. It's their age renew... Oh, maybe it is their overnight. No, I don't know if it's doubling up. Um, I don't think it's the age renew. It's the daily, it's the pink one. So it's their, it's the, sorry, it's their diabetic one. Gold bond diabetic moisturizer. Huh. All right. That, so, okay. Quick recap. We have dial hand soap on the face, which it instinctually makes me cringe a little bit. Like that can be, hand soap can be harsh because when you talk about a soap, it's actually fairly nuanced in that it should be pH balanced. Bar soaps historically are very alkaline and too hard for the skin. Um, and then I know there's fragrance strongly in most hand soaps. And so that can slap your face. You're rinsing it off. Sure, it's acceptable, perhaps. But I'm just going to say the soap is too harsh for your face. I don't really have a problem with the Neutrogena following it up. And then your Gold Bond Diabetic Moisturizer, which I'm not sure what the active ingredients are in this one off the top of my head. Yeah, so, you know, it's actually kind of nice. It's got some glycerin. It's got some urea, uh, petrolatum. It's like a thicker moisturizer, you know. So kind of a thicker cream-based moisturizer. It's even got some oat in it. Mm. Um, it's got some, you know, preservatives that are common allergens like uh, diazolidinol urea, um, which is a um, preservative allergen that we we commonly see. Um, works by, formal- it's a formaldehyde-releasing preservative that... Mm you know, it's common allergen in skincare products, but overall, you know, I, you know, uh, not, not the worst trend I've seen. I, and I completely agree with you. I think the cleanser is a little bit harsh. Like if you've ever used hand soap on your face, which I certainly have done in a bind, I've even used it on my hair in a bind. Um, and it, it really just re- removes all the oils on your skin. And so, especially if you have dry or sensitive skin, it's really going to tear you up. So that I don't, I don't like, uh, Neutrogena has always, always has made a great um, a, a great stabilized retinol. Um, I think their pro plus line has fragrance in it, but I like their rapid wrinkle repair mm-hmm. retinol, the fragrance for you one. I think it's a great retinol product. And then, um, not too many qualms with the, uh, gold bond moisturizer. Actually, they make some great products. You know, you may have some allergens to some of the ingredients in it, but that's not a reason to avoid it. So I would say not the worst trend I've seen. It's not the worst. I, I actually thought about something here. So, the, I mean, it's a good trend, right? If you just replace the soap, you're like, oh, actually, you know, it's decent. It's like decent. But if you replace the soap with, let's say, the CeraVe uh, gentle foaming cleanser or just a gentle cleanser, then it becomes an average routine. So I think that you have to have something trashy to make a completely viral routine. Like you can't just stack up three good products. You need like straight trash and then something good or like good, good wildly weird take on something that's what i think (laughs) yeah actually that's a good point so do like honestly like i feel like if i came on i was like hey this is the three step skincare routine we're using now cleanser retinol moisturizer like people would be like yeah yeah it's not fun (laughs) so how do we how do we get a good routine to go mega viral i just you market it all wrong you just get like, um, this is your butt cleanser and this, we're going to use it on the face. And then mm. you get like, oh, but this is, and then this is your moisturizer for your feet, for your face. And you secretly make it good. Maybe we use like toilet, like we use like the best routine at, like that we can think of. And then we use like toilet water <laughs> as like the, and then, and then we kind of like at the end, we're like, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding about the toilet water. <laughs> just use regular water a week later. I don't know. I feel like you're right. Like you have to have something that's going to like inspire comments um, in order to like really get traction. Like our videos get views regardless, I guess, but like the good stuff gets views, but it doesn't get like the like 20 million views itself 
but then like a hundred other people like repeating the routine, like that's like a viral moment. Um, I don't think we can create that ourselves. No, it's because um, I think dermatologists generally will have like a consistent take because we learn historical information that's passed down through science. And so while there is some subtle nuance and while there is some fun novel information, we're never going to grab like the product from the shed and then be like, oh, what if I just put this on my face? Oh, yeah, this is it. We're, that's never going to be our wreck. And it's never sexy. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, I think this isn't the worst. Um, just kind of switch out a few of the things and you're going to be good to go. Um, that's basically the routine we've recommended since day one, which is like cleanser, retinol, moisturizer. Uh, just pick pick a few better products, I suppose. Um, topic number two, we're going to be talking about uh, the fastest growing skincare brand in the United States two years in a row Wow, is La Roche-Posay. So... Um, you kind of feel it, you kind of feel that, you know, the kind of maturing skincare audience, people who are really like, all right, I want to, I want to get products that are really going to give me a bang for my buck. I feel like a lot of those people have adopted La Roche-Posay cleansers, moisturizers, sunscreens, especially. Um, and you know, it's doing really well. I, I'm a huge fan of La Roche-Posay. I've been ambassador, an ambassador for the brand for three years or so. And, um, I think I congratulate them and their team on the success that they've had. Oh, yeah. I'm thrilled for them. I, La Roche-Posay, I don't know why. I've like had this very obsessive, deeply passionate relationship with them and their products over the last few years. It started with their triple moisturizing cream for me. I was just like during the winter surfing. Yeah, there it is. He's showing it to the camera. My skin got destroyed one surf season and that cream just saved my whole body, face included. And from there, I was hooked. What I think is amazing about that line, though, I mean, I actually, who knows, you may know about more about the sales, but I think they're, they're doing this without a successful active line, which blows my mind. I, I think the staples are their cleansers, moisturizer, sunscreen. Yeah. I mean, in skincare, actually like moisturizers, sunscreens, cleansers, the high replenishment products, mm -hmm. um, are really do drive most brands actually. Um, same, same with CeraVe, like their, their cleanser line is and their moisturizer line is what drives all their sales, not their actives. So interesting to me because the actives I think are the interesting things, but like we've talked about when we were talking about our most reused skincare products, the actives were actually kind of the least used products, the cleansers and moisturizers were actually the deeper categories. So, uh, mm -hmm. that's just an interesting tidbit there. And actually I, we probably need to release that video we've been holding on to about them now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably is time now that they're the top dog time. two years in a row. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, with, with treatments, like they're very specific to people who need those issues, right? Like our remedy for dark spots, like you're not going to get too many people that don't have uneven skin tone or discoloration to buy that product. Right. So, so, you know, our total addressable market, we call that the TAM in marketing, um, is, uh, is smaller, um, for dark spots than it is for, for like cleansers and moisturizers, you know, that audience tends to be like a louder audience, right? Because they have a problem that they're looking for a solution for, but like the amount of people who need a cleanser and a moisturizer are much more than the amount of people who need a dark spot treatment. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, congrats. So, okay. Congrats to La Uh, we hope you continue to grow at that click. That's incredible. Um, and then next up, uh, this is coming out of Superdrug, which is a UK based retailer, kind of similar to Boots. I think it's number two in the UK um, as like a, a, um, a retail distribution center for skincare and other goods, of course. Um, and so Superdrug actually announced um, this past week that they're going to freeze prices across all of their cosmetics for like the next six months, right? So they're not going to let anyone increase the prices of anything and they're not going to increase the prices of any of their cosmetics and beauty uh, for like the next six months. Um, and they're trying to combat essentially rising costs of living and uh, just rising costs of consumer goods and inflation. So um, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, practically the only way to make it up is in volume. And so I think, so like if your margins decrease, right, like you're not making as much per transaction, but you, you're probably weren't making a huge overhead to begin with like the only sustainable option is sell more and i think it's perfect like if this is a unique take that they have planted their flag upon which it sounds like it is a unique position then i think just purely by attention it's going to elevate them significantly i think it's a novel idea i think six months is not a terribly 
long commitment barring wild changes in economies. So I, I kind of like it. I always like when people go out on a limb, create a little chaos um, and try something unique. So I, I think it's good. You know, it's, it reminded me of Arizona tea. I don't remember if those are still 99 cents, but I, I do remember during COVID, the pandemic when inflation was just monstrous, like when it was just spiking, 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 everything was rising. They planted their flag and said, we're still going to have it be a 99 cent can. And their margins, they said, were razor thin. But I think they squeaked through it. And maybe I'll check online, but I think their pricing never did change, which is kind of crazy for any consumable for the past five years. <laughs> yeah. The prices of things have gone up ridiculously. I mean, they'll quote you a 6%, 9% um, inflation rate. I, I think I think just from my personal experience, I don't know what they're using to measure the inflation rate, but I, I personally feel as if things are up at least 100% over the last three years. Um, I, I, I might have talked about this before, but I did a skincare routine, target skincare routine, anti-aging skincare routine, or maybe it was an acne routine. And I said, a TikTok video three years ago, building you an acne skincare routine under $50 or anti-aging skincare routine under $50, right? Boom, go out there. I buy five products um, at Target. And then now that routine is like $95. So, um, you know, it's gone up like double and um, it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. And I, I have to look at like the economics of this, but you know, I know initially around COVID time, people were, a lot of brands were not even just brands, skincare brands, but everybody from, you know, people who are selling electronics to people who are selling produce. Um, we're saying that it's due to supply chain, it's due to the rising cost of goods in general. And um, that's the reason why we're raising the prices. Now, I, I did see some report recently along the lines of like, essentially, those issues have eased um supply chain issues have eased cost of goods like raw materials has eased but brands never lowered their prices in fact they continue to increase their prices and and a lot of these companies are now showing like record numbers of record profits um as a result of like never really going back on on some of the issues and so they kind of set the new set point right like the new like mm -hmm. let's say a cleanser used to be fifteen dollars now it's twenty dollars um, but the cost of goods has now gone down for them, but they're going to keep that, that extra money. So maybe this is shoppers way or super drugs way of, um, of trying to cap that and send everyone back into, uh, some sense, some sense of reality. Now to your point, like, will it cause a lift of super drug? I actually probably think it won't. And the reason why is because like one of the bigger retailers in, in the UK is actually Amazon, just like it is here. Um, and so if super drug freezes their prices, so will Amazon because Amazon will always price match. So Amazon searches the web. Um, if they find anybody with the lower price, they match it. So um, essentially it's going to cap it at Amazon, which means that who's going to feel it the most actually is going to be the brands because the brands now have a cap on what they can retail products for. So um, that could be good. That could be bad. You know, if it is a brand that is running razor thin margins, like you described, they may need to have a price increase in order to, to make it work for them. So this will actually probably put a stranglehold on the brands, which so then maybe they go back to their suppliers and try to negotiate other things. And so um, I actually think this will have the biggest impact on the brands themselves. Um, and, you know, maybe there needs to be put pressures on people throughout the industry. Maybe this is something that um, can, can actively right now, like we expect the government to control inflation by increasing interest rates like that's kind of the historical way that we deal is deal with this but we don't really see a lot of responsibility from either retailers or brands to combat inflation like on a smaller scale um and is it is it the risk like like for example like is it the responsibility this is like a kind of a larger topic like when it comes to sustainability is it the responsible responsibility of the government to put in regulations that increase sustainability of products or it should it be on the brands that are sort of best in class to lead the charge on that yeah that's a good question um I, i'm a definitely a ground up person so i because i want to empower every individual to like feel like they can make a change and i think that i actually think it goes further than the brands i think you can do it with purchasing power mm. but uh yeah, I'd love to see the brands do this. I'd love to see people do that. And then the brands follow suit. And then the big picture follows after that. That's how I like dominoes to fall. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. 
I, I we'll see how it affects it. I like though that they're taking a stance, I guess, on that to try to help cap that too. Yeah, I think things have just gotten totally out of control, and you know, average person who's just trying to have better skin, or the average person that's just trying to have a good, healthy meal. Um, you know, I think they're the ones that always get the brunt of all this. So, um, hopefully this has some type of larger impact on the industry to some extent. Um, next up, uh, YouTube, according to business insider could be worth up to $400 billion. Now, the reason why we bring up this article is because YouTube, um, traditionally is ignored by everybody. Um, (laughs) especially brands, especially, um, especially like, you know, the traditional media companies, right? Like you, a lot of people, you'll always hear about Netflix and their subscribers and their revenue. And you always hear about, um, you know, Peacock and Hulu and what they're up to. But I think a lot of times, like as an industry, um, YouTube is often ignored as a streaming platform and YouTube's valuation, according to this article, like far outpaces what Netflix is, would be worth. Now, now YouTube is owned by Alphabet or Google. So you often don't look at it like a separate entity. Um, but when you look at the, the the amount of advertising dollars, profitability, revenue that actually comes in through YouTube, it is a massive platform with massive influence and it's free, um, barring any like advertisements that go on the website. It's free for consumers. Um, and they have endless sources of, con- uh, content. You know, I always think about like a Netflix, like every time they come out with a, a new movie or a new show that's popular for like two weeks at a time, like the amount of effort, the amount of money, the amount of coordination, the amount of everything that it requires to launch a show on Netflix is massive. Whereas you could have like individual people, like if you think about us on our YouTube channel, we're feeding the machine with free content. Like YouTube pays <laughs> zero dollars to 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 acquire this content from us like they share like for those of you who don't know they they share ad revenue with us so like if they show an ad on our video or they show whatever they, what, i don't i don't know what their what their calculation looks like but ultimately there's amount of ad revenue that that youtube gets from advertisers and then they split that amongst the creators uh who are creating the content right but it's almost like they only they like it's always like in proportion to the amount of like views and stuff that you're doing. And so it doesn't cost them anything to generate content. The content is free for them and they only pay anyone unless if the content does well. Um, and so it's like an ingenious business model because they have this endless source of content um, and people spend hours and hours and hours watching YouTube and YouTube only has to host it, which is expensive, obviously, to host that, that uh, the, those file sizes and, you know, keep the platform up and running. But Overall, they have this endless stream of unlimited content. You can find anything on YouTube nowadays. Yeah, I still say it's the best place to learn. I, um, I mean, you learn anything, anything to I think any complexity. I don't think there's an endpoint in terms of expertise through YouTube. And I'm, I'm actually kind of happy. To, I was happy to see this, which is why I shared it because I love long form content. Um, I was talking to this with some derms uh, in San Diego. I think a doctor's especially. There's always a nuance that is not felt and difficult to communicate in short form and then youtube youtube you get to elaborate on it more right there's always a little bit more to the conversation i mean i've learned so much through youtube chess i've ex- pretty much exclusively learned through youtube at this point i did i think two or three maybe four lessons tops with a, a tutor but i was like this is just not how i learn i learned by teaching myself at this point and i have since prior to medical school so um yeah just youtube that is my teacher in life at this point apparently I, I look up everything on YouTube. Um, I, I find it to be a way more efficient way to learn than Googling things nowadays. Like you Google and I mean, the top search, the top result, the amount of advertisements that you see, the amount of like SEO, SEO search engine optimization. A lot of companies basically optimize their website. So it ranks higher in search. People that tend to be very good at that tend to put garbage at the top of your feed. Um, and so like it, it, it's, which is why I think chat GPT has been so successful also is because it also kind of sifts through the nonsense and summarizes with their language model. But, um, short answer, <laughs> um, you know, I find you to be a very efficient way to learn things and whether it's editing videos, um, yeah. whether it's even touching up on doctor stuff in the office, right. In the office, yeah. you know, I might be like, Oh, I haven't done this thing in a long time. Like, let me watch a refresher video on, on YouTube. Um, it's all there and it's just how you use it and interpret it. Um, but everything is in there. You can find anything from our videos on how to treat acne to how to fix the toilet, to, you know, how to change the oil on your car, how to, 
um, how to inject Botox. Like you can find anything on YouTube. It's all free. It's all super available to you. Um, and it's relatively succinct, especially the videos that tend to do well, um, tend to show up top on the YouTube search tend to be the videos that are, are more helpful for you. So, um, so overall, I think YouTube is an incredibly powerful platform. I think it's an incredible way to share information. I think for us, um, and you know, our platform, I find it to be the, our best form of content, right? So when I meet people and I'm like, oh, like people are like, oh, you're on, you're on TikTok, um, on Instagram. And I think that's where I have the largest reach because, you know, you'll get like a billion views on, on those platforms. But I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, well, you, I, I know you've seen me there, but like you should also <laughs> check out YouTube because, um, we do a lot more detailed stuff there. And, and I'm essentially prouder, let's just put it that way mm -hmm. of the work that we do on YouTube because me too. I, I think we really go into details. Um, I think the information is super useful um, and organized on YouTube where like you can actually come in and know nothing about a particular topic and throughout one or two videos, like you can really learn as much as you need to like take action. Um, and where I, where I feel like TikTok videos or Instagram videos, like there's just not enough to like someone to leave with like enough information to, you know, act upon it with enough knowledge. And so that's what I love about YouTube is I feel like it's a very complete resource. And like you said, like we can get into the nuances of why something could be good, but also could be bad. Um, and I, I feel like it is difficult in short form to do that well. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely been extremely rewarding. Uh, you know what I hate though? My nurses, especially the youngest ones, I'm like, you know, I mean, they, some of them know who we are, who I am when they come on board. And, um, some, many of them though, they're like YouTube, Nah, what's YouTube? No one watches that. This is for old people. Really? YouTube is for old people. Uh, that's what they say. That the uh I've had a few twenty somethings. <laughs> so interesting. My nephew, like uh and I don't he's seven. Um, all he watches is YouTube. All he watches is YouTube. His heroes are Mr. Beast and <laughs> others, you know. So all they know are these YouTubers. Actually, okay. all the celebrities they know are YouTubers. All the videos they watch are YouTubers. Um, and so maybe it's like Gen Gen Z is not big on YouTube, but Gen Alpha and mm -hmm. lower Gen Beta, I guess, is coming next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they're going to be big, big, big on YouTube. And the other thing about YouTube is that YouTube is big in India um, because TikTok was banned in India. So. Um, when TikTok was banned in India, everybody kind of went to YouTube and YouTube shorts. Um, you know, Instagram reels didn't come until much after YouTube shorts. And so, um, you know, internationally, YouTube has a massive, massive presence. The other thing about YouTube is that they'll translate your content into other languages. Um, they have subtitles, um, to make it easy for people to follow along, whether you have, you, you know, you can't hear whether you speak a different language. Like it, it's just a, a much more accessible platform, I think internationally as well. Um, on YouTube, we have a very large global audience um, with the largest percentage coming from the U S but it's still actually less than, I believe it's less than 50% of our audiences in the U S um, though. It's like the biggest audience is in the U S I think it's still less than 50% of the U S I could be wrong. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's one of my favorite things too. Uh, the global community we have is it's actually one of my absolute favorite things about our community me, me too but they're all mad that i didn't launch the brand I internationally <laughs> I know those comments i loved it i was texting for those of you who don't know which no one would i was texting dr shaw the day i launched and like the comments were amazing like such an incredible rewarding experience so many of them so many i texted i was like so many people want you to ship this out overseas like it, i felt like it was half the comments <laughs> it was amazing in a positive way, in a sense, but we got to get them there. <laughs> yeah, if you look, so I'm looking at it right now, 40% um, of our audience is in the US. The other 60% doesn't amazing. have access to the products that, that with Remedy yet and wow. the, you know, and also, but like the global reach of content is like incredible. Like, think about this, like, you know, somebody in another country, you know, even me, like I might be watching content from somebody like in another country that I'm learning from. Oh, like, like even when I travel, right? Like before I travel, like I watch YouTube videos. I'm like the top five places to see in Japan. Right. And it's like some, some Japanese guy, like giving the, you know, the, the, the rundown of this. Right. So like the global, re I mean, I just, I, I just find like the global reach of content and YouTube specifically, like to be such an incredible platform to like 
really like kind of create like even create like a global community where like we're not so different you know it's like yeah you get to see like this other side of the world without even having to travel there which i i've said in the past like i think travel like really kind of opens your mind to other cultures and it keeps you out of this like mindset of like oh like you know where you're born is like the only thing that exists um and so i think in a way youtube does the same thing because it gives you access to a global audience yeah my shout my shout out the dermatologist like my favorite encounters we went to the aid this year we're from dermatologists globally. I can remember a few, but I remember some, a doctor and her, her husband from uh, Nepal, the warmest people. They just like came out of nowhere, Dr. Maxfield, like down the <laughs> hall. And then there was a couple of doctors from India. And I mean, one of my dreams, I think at this point would for us, be us to like interact and uh, go to the, some of these countries. I know you mentioned like the incredible experience you had in Southeast Asia and, uh, boy, that would be a dream come true uh, if we get to just interact with some of our peers, professionals, and just people in our community across the world one day. I don't know when it's going to happen because it's a huge, huge investment, but uh, that would be a dream come true. Maybe it should be a bucket list thing. Um, it sounds like a bucket list thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that would be amazing um, because it, it really is such a cool thing. Um, and you're right. Like, that's such a, like, you're thinking like, oh, like, even people I see, like Mex Mexican um dermatologists i see their content and then like i see them at the ad i'm mm -hmm. like hey <laughs> what's up you know, uh you're you know like we're worlds apart right um yeah. you know on the east coast of mexico as far you know so it's just it's just interesting like I, I think it's super cool so um so yeah youtube is great um ultimately so uh this podcast is available on youtube it's also available on <laughs> apple podcasts and uh and spotify so um, thank you all so much for tuning in. We covered the skincare trifecta. We covered the most popular brand growing in the United States. We covered price freezing of skincare products. Um, let us know what you think. And then uh, YouTube, of course. And then uh, let, let me know um, what you all want me to create next with Remedy. Um, would love to see. I've been reading all the comments. So is there anything specific you'd like to see um, from the brand to release? Um, we're in, actively in product development phase. And so if you if you have anything that you want let us know and we can work on it that's great it's good can't wait to see what you all say and what he comes out with next but thank you all we appreciate you so much all right we'll see you all next week